fire. Its power is undeniable. Its existence is both a factor in creation and destruction. In a fragile ecosystem, fire will feed and grow until there's no more fuel. When it's done, it will leave a reminder of its power. This reminder is a fire scar. Our friend Laura from the Bureau of Land Management takes us on a tour of a section of Scar Desert. Once a place teeming with life, it continues to heal 15 years after the fire. I like to hope that I might be able to make a difference for the desert. So that's what's important to me. You know, it's interesting when, when we come upon something like this, I look over this area, something happened here. It just doesn't look right. Can you tell me what the, the history of this place? So this area was part of the 2005 Good Springs fire, burned 30,000 acres. It's a lightning caused fire. Um, and this red brome here, which is an invasive species, helped carry the fire. You're talking about this grass like yeah, thing, right? Yeah, this grass. So it's non-native. It just fills the space between the shrubs. And so it carries fire really well. And the problem with it is also fire adapted. And so when there is a fire, it comes back even thicker than before. So what now? Because obviously there's lots of damage and, and these were very old. So what happens now? Yeah, so we're, we're 15 years past these fires now and it's still not where we want it to be. Um, one of my coworkers, his name is JJ Smith, he does restoration for our office. He's working on a very cool project with USGS to try to restore this habitat. How do you do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I wish it was an easier answer. We kind of don't know yet. We're trying a lot of different things. We're trying seeding, outplanting um, seedlings. We're trying what they're calling diversionary seeding, so putting um, sterile seed out that the animals will take instead of the native seed. Um, we're trying different types of weed treatments, just a whole host of things to try to figure out what works best for the least amount of money. Why do we care about restoring this? Obviously there's an aesthetic, but I know you're, you're passionate about it. Why? For me, a big part of it is the plant diversity. I think that's really important. It's important for keeping the soils in place. That helps air quality, that helps water quality. It's important to people in Las Vegas. It's also, this is habitat for the threatened Mojave Desert tortoise. And so this is not great habitat for the tortoise anymore. It's not awful, but this, they can't, this grass is really not good for them to eat. And so we wanna make it better for that species specifically. Can you not just go out somewhere, find a bunch of these trees and replant them here since, you know, we're, we're looking at things that aren't coming back? Yeah, so we, we could do that. The problem is, for one, these trees are really long lived. So you have to raise them for maybe 50 years before they get to the size to outplant them. They also need a lot of water. So when you grow something, you want to get it big fast in the greenhouse, right? You give it all the water, all the nutrients it wants. Then you put it out in the desert, it has nothing. So unless you're bringing it water, you're bringing it nutrients, it can die right away. So you have that big investment up front and then the plants don't survive. You have a puzzle to unravel, young lady, <laughs> don't you? I do, and there's a lot of really great people in my office that I work with and we're all working towards that goal. How much hope do you have? I, I have a lot of hope. I think I work with really awesome people who really care about this place and about the species that live here, the animals and the plants. And I think, you know, hopefully great minds can try to solve this problem. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're one of them. Let's keep heading this way. What can the average man or woman do to help you in your cause? I think it's important for the public to stay on existing roads and trails. That's a big deal, not creating new roads. It's just more disturbance that these plants have to deal with. Um, another big thing is making sure you're fo following all the fire restrictions that are in place. So if the forest or the BLM has said, no fire, don't burn a fire, because that's how we have a lot of problems here in Southern Nevada. You know, this isn't all one kind of grass. I mean, I know the invasive grass that comes from Russia, but there's other grass here, isn't there? Yeah, there's some native grasses. Um, we can look around and see if we can find some, but there's a, it's called fluff grass, and that one is native. And you can kind of tell 
that it's native because it's not totally filling these inner spaces. It's got these little distinct patches where it grows. Speaking of patches, Laura, I noticed these patches of like what I thought was burned land, but it, it, it doesn't feel like that. No, so what you're looking at is actually what we call biological soil crust. So it's made up of a bunch of different soil organisms. So there's lichen, there's moss, and those things help hold the soil together, but they're, they're actually alive. Wow, so it, this, what appears to be burned soil is actually a very good thing. Yeah, it's great for the desert. What about this bush here? This is different. So this is a creosote bush, and this is the plant that everyone associates in addition to the Joshua tree with the Mojave Desert. So this plant is everywhere. You'll see it almost everywhere in the Mojave Desert, and that's part of why it's so important. What makes this one different? It's not, it's just not by itself? So it, this plant grows clonally, so sometimes you'll see them growing in rings out from the same plant. That's all one organism. And so these are some of the oldest organisms that exist on the planet today. How old is that? So estimates are that the oldest one that they know of right now is over 11,000 years old. Oh my gosh. So think about what this plant has seen in its lifetime. I mean, 11,000 years ago, I, I can't even imagine. That's older than the bristlecone pine, right? Yeah, that is. Bristlecone pines are around 5,000 years old. So That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And the fact that you know that and can share that with me, I just cannot tell you how valuable that is. As a matter of fact, this whole day has been very valuable to me. I get to see it through your eyes and it's a whole different story. So I just, I want to thank you and your team for everything that you're doing. It's vitally important that we understand this information. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when she comes out here, she sees an entirely different story than most of us. But based on what she's saying here today, it's a story that we should all read and understand. I hope you'll do your part.